I want to thank you all for inviting me here, and particularly I want to thank Peter. I've known Peter now for four years, and uh, after we met at uh, an event in Santa Monica, California, literally two blocks from where I live, we became friends and continued to communicate, and when he told me about this event, he asked me if I'd like to come and present, and of course I jumped at the chance. Having never been to this part of the world, uh, it was a very big eye-opener for me to come into Harlem and see the bicycles, to see the, the train station. When I went to the train station, babies on the bike, no helmets, no helmets needed. Where I live, you, you take your life in your hands if you ride a bicycle, and everybody wears helmets because there's a really good chance you'll get hit by a car. So it's very different between your country and ours. You've done so many things right. We have so much to learn from you. But at the same time, our problems are so severe that we have to take pretty drastic measures. And this is why those of us who started Plug in America did what we did. We were lucky enough to come across these cars uh, when they first came out 10, 11 years ago. And then they started taking them back. They took them out of our hands and crushed the cars. And we had experienced that. So we, we, we said, you can't do that. And so we stood up and we yelled and screamed until we got some notice until we won a few of the battles along the way. But we lost many of the battles. They crushed over 5,000 cars. But then some things started happening and I started learning about this. I wasn't just yelling and screaming to stop this. I had to become an advocate. I had to learn how to work within the system. And so Plug in America became a little more professional. We brought people in from Microsoft in the Seattle area who really knew how to manage things and were a lot smarter than we were. Uh, but then, then we started to grow as an organization. So the, the case I want to make today has to do with the economics. I can talk all day long about the health benefits, about the environmental benefits, about the national security benefits, but the economic benefits are what drive things. That's what will make this happen. That's what will uh, eventually you know, turn all transportation, all uh, personal transportation into uh, running on renewable electricity. It is inevitable. All you have to do is think 100 years into the future. Will we be using internal combustion to move ourselves? No, clearly not. So sometime between now and 100 years from now, we make the transition fully. My goal in life is to make it happen as fast as possible, to mitigate the problems. And what are the problems? And saw thousands of bicycles. I couldn't believe it. I'm taking pictures and sending them back home. And we read about this, but to actually see them and to see people riding up and down the streets with their children in the front. Okay, so oil, of course, has given us many benefits over the, the last century plus. Uh, we've been able to grow industry and uh, move people and move trucks and so forth. So it's given us benefits, but at a great cost. So the cost you pay at the pump is not the true cost of oil. As you can see in the upper left, this is a recent oil spill in a suburb in, I believe it was Kansas. There were so many of them, I don't remember what the picture is from. But this oil spill was from a, a, a ruptured pipeline, just came into the neighborhood and poured oil. Now that entire neighborhood is now vacant. Everybody had to leave. Um, and of course, you have the military aspect of it. Uh, we just fought a war in Iraq. And a raise of hands here, how many people believe that the US because we did it, not you. How many people believe that the US would have fought the war in Iraq if Iraq had the same amount of oil as North Korea? No hands. I never get any hands up on that one. Of course not. Oil had to do with the Iraq war. So we spent $2.1 trillion on that war, lost thousands of soldiers, tens of thousands of wounded, and we literally murdered hundreds of thousands of civilians. That's a cost. The RAND Corporation, which is a major think tank in the US, did some calculations, some studies, found that we spend every year $80 billion in military protection for oil around the world. The US does. I'm sure other countries spend some as well, but we spend the lion's share. When you buy gasoline in the US at the pump, you pay nothing for that. Nothing for the 2.1 trillion, nothing for the dead people. And my apologies. You know, I, I meant to preface this because you're such a, a happy country. I mean, everybody I've met here has been very nice. I see no angry people. I'm going down the streets and nobody's angry. Where I live, people are angry. 
and it's because they drive cars and, and people are trying to kill them, so they get angry. It's understandable. But here, everybody's not angry, but I, I meant to preface that I was going to say some things that are not so pleasant to hear, but it's part of what I have to tell you. So we fight wars over oil. We kill people over oil. Yet when you buy oil, you don't pay for that. Another cost of oil is, this is a picture of downtown Los Angeles. Uh, it's a summertime picture. Summer is much worse. We get these inversions and, and the air is kept down and, and there's, uh, it's a lot better. It, it used to be much worse. So catalytic converters and more efficient engines have mitigated some of the problem, but it's still very, very bad there. Um, and a lot of the pollution you can't see. So there's deadly things in the air spewing out of internal combustion tailpipes that you can't see, but it causes health problems. So you've got situations like this all the time. Where I work, I work at a car dealership in downtown Los Angeles, and uh, we're right at the corner of two major freeways, uh, two of the busiest freeways in the country. A quarter million cars travel on each of those freeways. So that intersection, sees about half a million cars per day. And there's a school, literally a block from our dealership, right at the crux of those two freeways, a school. And I walk by that school regularly to get cars from where we park them, and I see children in the playground. It's an asphalt playground, no grass. It's a hot day, and they're out there playing soccer, shooting hoops, doing calisthenics, and there's a half a million cars driving by. 99.999% spewing poison into the air that they breathe. This is an economic injustice, uh, environmental injustice. Climate change, many of you have heard of it. Those people in this room probably believe it's real. Where I come from, at least a third to half of the population doesn't believe it's real. And I won't go into the reasons for that. You probably have heard of Fox News. Enough said. Um, so ignorance is rampant, and, and it's a, a serious problem. But climate change is the big one. Wars are bad. You know, the health consequences of internal combustion are bad. But climate change is really bad, and it's coming. And many of you are young enough, you will see some major effects of that uh, in the future. So mass equals money. It takes money to move mass. So the bigger, the heavier the car, uh, the more energy it takes to move it. If you look at a freeway in LA at rush hour, and it's literally tens of thousands of cars going in both directions, creeping along in many cases because it's so jam-packed, you can barely move. And internal combustion engines are incredibly inefficient in, in that circumstance, whereas an electric car, it gets really good efficiency when you're just barely moving along. So, that alone will save a lot of, of energy. Um, but we have Hummers there and large SUVs with one person in them. And I come here and I go to the train station and I see thousands of bicycles and people riding bikes feeding in and out from that. Where I come from, all of those bicycles are cars with one person in them. And, and I see what you've done here. Now I know you've got cars because I, I we took a bus up to Amsterdam last night and rode on roads with cars. So yeah, there are cars, but in my mind it's like, this is nothing. You have, you, the bus is moving, number one, so it's not parked in a long line of cars. So you, you're most of the way there. You just need to get rid of a little bit more. But it does take money to move mass. So um, the lighter things are, the less energy it takes, the less money it costs. If you have a human powering a bicycle, it just costs food, and you gotta eat food anyway. And by the way, I, I noticed there, there are no obese people that I've seen yet. In, in the US, they're everywhere. It's half the population, or over half, are morbidly obese, and there's a reason for that. You guys are riding bicycles, and they're sitting in an SUV. So, where's the money go? So, uh, we're spending close to three trillion a year uh, on, on energy, and a lion's share of that is oil. And where, where does the money go? Well, you know, there's a picture of Dubai, a big tower that they built, and I could have shown you pictures of palaces and 
literally gold-plated cars that they're buying over there with our money. Um, and this map up in the upper left, uh, it's where I used to live in Eugene, Oregon. This is the county, Lane County, Oregon. It's a small place. I mean, there's not that many people, maybe 200, 300,000 people live there. But they're sending out of the county $800 million a year to buy gasoline. Now, they're not a rich area. 800 million, had it stayed in the county and spread around, would have been a big boon, would be, will be a big boon to their economy in the not too distant future if they stop buying oil and use electricity. They have very cheap electricity there. It's mostly hydro, costs eight cents a kilowatt hour. You guys are spending 20 to 25 cents. Um, theirs is very clean energy and very cheap. So the electric vehicles are starting to catch on in the Pacific Northwest, Oregon and Washington, because they have so much hydropower. It's very clean. They have a strong environmental ethic as well. So, you know, they're, they're starting to catch on there. There are five, one, one two, three, four, five, six, no, five, five uh, oil companies from... Uh, what was it, uh, I'm sorry, 20, about five years worth. Um, I'm sorry, I can read that. I, I don't have my glasses, so I'm not being able to read any. So anyway, we're spending over 700 billion every year for oil. Uh, this is our country alone, not, not worldwide. And that, uh, over 500 billion of that is automobile transportation. The rest of it is trucking and, and jet fuel. Uh, so half a trillion dollars is leaving our economy every year. And it's going to the pockets of the people in the Middle East and Colombia, Venezuela, uh, Mexico, Canada, and Houston in uh, Texas. So people are getting that money. We have to earn it, and then we have to spend it, and other people are getting it. It's not in our economy anymore. It's not being spent to do good. So we have a real problem with that because... As we all know, the entire world has suffered since 2008 when the economic decline, yet we all continue to spend money on petrol, gasoline, and that money leaves our economy and is not in our pockets so we can spend it. Those of us who get electric cars, we stop giving those people our money. And cumulatively, it's starting to add up now. We have, three years ago, there were 3,000 electric cars in the U.S. Today, there's about 140,000. That's a very steep growth. Now, we've got 260 or so million vehicles, so 140,000 is a very, very small percentage of that. But if you look at the growth rate, it's very steep. So in a few years, we'll hit a million. And then it won't be long after that when we hit 2 million, 4 million, 8 million. The growth rate will be quite rapid. So that money leaving our economy will start staying in our economy. California is an example uh, we spent in 2010 $55 billion on gasoline and diesel. 90% of that money left California for good. And that's $50 billion a year. Now, we're a rich state, we're a big state, but $50 billion is a lot of money even to us. If that money, when that money starts staying in our economy and circulates around because the average person will spend 20 cents on the dollar 20% of the money they spend on oil will be spent on electricity based on the average price of a kilowatt hour and the average price of a gallon of gasoline in the U.S. So the 20 cents on the dollar goes to the utility or to amortize the cost of a solar system if you have a good roof. So you're paying yourself the 20 cents. The other 80 cents stays in your pocket. Now you're going to spend it on whatever you want. Most people will save a little bit, but they'll spend most of it on local goods and services. And if we're talking about $50 billion in a state the size of California, that's a lot of economic activity. Here in the Netherlands, it's got to be billions of dollars every year that you're sending out. You have no domestic oil that I'm aware of. So any oil that you purchase comes from somewhere else, which means the ships come in with the oil and the boatloads of money leave. And that's money that you'll never see again. So as you start converting over, and when you make your arguments, because many of you are policy people, as you make your arguments to the powers that be, and they say, how are we going to afford this? This is how you afford it. Because as you stop sending money out for oil, that money stays, and people will spend it. It'll circulate in your economy, 
and it will generate thousands of jobs, tens of thousands of jobs, and create new wealth, and the wealth will not leave your community. So this is a very important uh, point. So uh, public awareness, you know, we've, we've really started to make a headway on that, finally. And I have to give credit to Tesla, uh, the gentleman who was speaking about that was spot on, because Tesla has changed the game quite effectively. Uh, Ten years old, uh, the company is, and they come out with their first uh, purpose-built electric car as the best car in history. Uh, it was obviously the best car of the year, but there's, you can't name another car that, is, that has ever been built that is as good as the Tesla. And that's their first car, so it's only going to get better from there. So they've raised the bar nationally, or globally, I should say, because they've come out with such a good car. And so now, no longer do we hear, oh, these are just glorified golf carts. They're underpowered, you know, you know, what do you, it's just a tin can going down there. We get all kinds of derisive comments uh, from the naysayers, the EV haters that we call them. Uh, but they're starting to get quiet now because all we have to do is say, well, have you driven a Model S? Well, no. Well, you should try that and then come talk to me about the car. So there's some powerful people who've gotten in the game and that's really helped a lot. Uh, you see uh, Bill Ford with uh, President Obama down below. Now, Ford has gotten in the game pretty well. Uh, they're still just being, building compliance cars, which means California has a law that says if you sell cars in California, you have to have a certain number of credits. In order to get these credits, you have to have a certain number of your sales with plug-in cars. And so they're building just enough and selling just enough to comply with that law. They're not all in yet. Uh, Nissan and General Motors, on the other hand, are all in. You know, they've, they've, gone to the, they've come to the game ready to play. And uh, I was lucky enough to have lunch. And the reason I work for Nissan today is because they flew me back to Yokohama to test drive the Leaf when it was first, the first production model came out. And then I was uh, able to have lunch with Mr. Ghosn. And he assured me that he was taking the entire company electric over time. It might be news to some of you in the room, but uh, it was an eye opener for me. And so when I was flying back home, I thought I, I could sell that car all day long. I could use a little extra income. So I walked into a dealership in Santa Monica, and this is several months before the car was ready to deliver. And I told the guy, I said, I just had lunch with Carlos Ghosn and test drove the Leaf, and I can make you the number one Leaf dealer in the nation. And he looked at me and, and like, you had lunch with Carlos Ghosn? And, and so I kind of name dropped in order to get the job, but I got the job and immediately, you know, that was the number one dealer in the nation because I had this list of people who were willing to buy. Um, so big players are coming to the table. Not, not all of them are all in, but the, the heavy hitters like Ford and, and GM and BMW is coming out now, and BMW is going to be a major player. Uh, and of course, Nissan, they're pushing the bar for the mass market. Tesla is working from the top down. Uh, and, and they will come out with a game-changing car in three to four years called the Model E. Now, you might notice that they have the next year is the Model X, and they currently have the Model S. And if you take the Model S, the Model X, and the Model E and rearrange them a little bit, you have a sexy company. <laughs> um, this was my first Leaf. I now have a black one. Um, but just to show you, we've got cars that are... Uh, definitely affordable by the middle America. The average price paid for a car in the U.S. is $30,000. And after incentives, a new Nissan LEAF, the base model, is $20,000 in the U.S. Before incentives, it's right at thirty. dollars But we do have about $10,000 in incentives in the U.S. and Cal uh, California spe specifically. And so you're, you're looking at a $20,000 car that costs very little to operate. We have a lot of free charging in the U.S. Uh, and quite frankly, there was a lot of discussion about how do you get the charging infrastructure built out. And the model that I see coming and the model that I'm going to be working on in the future is free charging paid for by advertising. And we think it'll work in, in California. We we're going to try it in Barcelona and pro probably Shanghai as well, or Beijing. Uh, but watch for that. And it might be something that you can emulate here. Here's the Model S again, just the, you know, the, the, the finest car ever made, um, and just the first of what will be many. So this, this Model E that I mentioned a while ago, 
is going to be a $35,000 car with a 200-mile range, 0 to 60 in about six seconds. And when that car hits, everybody in the U.S. will then understand that this is the best technology. I might not be able to afford one right now, they'll say, but I know that the next car I get will have a plug on it. And so that's the, that's the tipping point that we see in three to four years. Obviously, Nissan, Ford, all the other manufacturers will build up to that. They may not be able to hit the standard of Tesla, uh, but they're going to try very hard. So in 100 years, what's going to power our, our, our transportation? Clearly, it's not going to be oil. We'll be long out of oil in 100 years. Um, but wind and solar uh, are so cheap now. In the U.S., wind is cheaper than coal, new coal. And solar will be there in five years. So why would you want to use dirty energy? And this is without, by the way, a tax on carbon. But we need that. Uh, there are so many cars coming out. We have many uh, examples. This, this is an old slide. I really need to update this slide. Uh, but you saw an earlier version from the other gentleman who showed many other cars that are coming. So there's now many choices. Um, but to, to end it, and, and this is the key point I wanted everybody to take away. You know, we've been talking here about the incentives that you can do to get people to buy the cars. But in reality, those incentives can only go so far because the other side of the equation isn't real. Uh, and that is the, the costs of using oil that I talked about initially are not internalized in the price. So we need these incentives, and if anybody tries to tell you, oh, you don't need those incentives, or why don't you let these cars compete on an open playing field, you know, we're all for that, but they're not paying the full cost of theirs. So you either have carrots, incentives, to entice people to come and get the cars, or you have a stick, and you internalize the external costs of oil into the price. You internalize the cost of a kilowatt hour that comes from coal or natural gas so that the price of that rises. And then you have a level playing field. And then you can remove the incentives from the EVs and from solar and wind because they won't be necessary anymore. People will readily go for the cleaner, cheaper option because solar is cheaper, wind is cheaper, electric cars are cheaper. They're better and cheaper. We just don't have uh, a reality of the marketplace right now because all those external costs, and they're huge, the military, the health, the environmental costs, we're talking about well over 100 billion a year just for the US, probably 200 billion a year worldwide. And so once that happens, then we've got a level playing field and the market will work at that point, but until then we need to maintain whatever incentives you can encourage your governments to give. Thank you. Thank you.